All right, let's start this morning with another pain in the neck. I originally told you that I was shooting for Monday for your first exam. I lied. It's going to be Wednesday. I've been sitting up there going, can I really get through what I need to get through between now and the end of class on Friday? And I decided I'm not going to lecture at 9,000 miles an hour to make sure I finish by Friday. And so we can have test on Monday, but we'll have test one on Wednesday of next week for sure. Sorry if that messes up your daily planner. Or what you were planning on doing Tuesday night. The second bitter pill to swallow here is another very short homework assignment. By the end of class today, we're going to get to the section in this chapter that deals with what is referred to as dramatic criticism. Most of the time when you use the word or think of the word criticism or to criticize or to critique, it means to look for fault in something, to try to discover what was not well done about something. Uh, again, to look for fault in it. For our purposes in this class, a better definition is going to be analysis. Let's analyze what was there. And then let's look for the value in what was there. And obviously in terms of critiquing or criticizing a stage play, a film, a television program, you know, usually you're, you're looking for what was bad about it. Well, let's analyze this and look at it from different points of view. You know, what was there? And was what was there of any value? As opposed to saying, well, this wasn't there, so it wasn't any good. My friend back there, probably no blood and guts and explosions and excessive violence, so damn it, it's terrible. Really? And I'll go back to that statement I made earlier when I broached this subject ever so briefly. And I will clean up the old saying. Opinions are like noses. Everyone has one, but what makes yours the right one? You're going to come off and say, well, Granath, you're always giving us your opinion and you're trying to tell us it's the right one. Well, a couple of million dollars in education and 40 plus years in this business, I got an idea of what's good and bad. At least I dig them well better at this point. But anyway, the point of all of this is a little homework assignment. What I want you to do is to jot down three or four criteria statements that you can apply to something that you see that will allow you to determine its quality. Criteria statements. You apply that statement to the production and you can determine then, okay, it met it so it must be good. It didn't meet it so it must not be so good. And your immediate reaction is going to go back to that survey that I talked about, that national survey. We're looking for top quality acting. Well, duh, yes, but you can't use that. This is going to be an exercise in one of those geometry proofs that I took about 2,000 years ago in the ninth grade. But do you remember back when you took geometry in high school, middle school, wherever it was? I don't know anymore. Uh, you did these things that were called proofs. Given this, you have that. Do you have any vague remembrance of those godforsaken things? Anybody? Yeah, well, yeah. 
So what I'm getting at here is that we know if it's going to be of high quality, it's automatically going to have good writing, good directing, good acting, good scenery, good lighting, good costuming. All those things are already going to be there. Those are the givens of this exercise. So what you've got to search for are things that go above and beyond that to try to determine through your criteria statements whether we have a production here of quality or a lack thereof. So yeah, it went from being some obvious things to something a little more difficult. But do you follow what I'm driving at here? I've got a lot of faces looking at me like you want. What? I'm asking you to think about what moves it, as he put it, to the level of quality entertainment. It's like I mentioned, my daughters, they both order chicken something or other every time we go anywhere. Well, how many dead gum times can you eat the same thing before you get tired of it? You can probably say, well, how many days are you going to drink coffee in class and not get tired of it? Well, that's an addiction. Speaking of which, let me get a hit. <laughs> That are some other things that I could possibly engage in. But that's your little homework assignment. Jot these things down in the appropriate manner, i.e., I can't read your handwriting. So, print, there it is, hand it to me. But we'll be using that in class on Friday and on Monday, probably. But there you have it. Now, where I left off. Yo! You're not applying this to a particular film or television show or stage play. It is a generic list of several statements that you can apply to anything that you use. That's it. But again, remember good acting, good directing, good writing, good cinematography if it's a film, those are going to be present if it's of high quality. So those are already there. You can't use those. And if you try to, you're going to hear what you hear on that guy's uh, game show. <coughs> what is the name of that thing? The survey says! Yeah, there you go. I have a question. At least he called the right winner for the Miss Universe pageant this time. So when you say it's generic, um, is it over all? Is it over all theater and film? Any kind of production you see that has an actor speaking dialogue in front of the public. So I I can say something specific about theater, or does it have to be theater and other stuff? Well, I, if, if, if it covers theater, it covers everything else. We wouldn't have film and television if we didn't have theater. I mean, it's all the same. I mean, it's actors, you know, speaking dialogue in front of some kind of an audience. So, you know, that's the reason I say it's kind of generic. But we're not applying it to a specific film or a specific play. You can't evaluate Shakespeare differently than you de do you know, Tennessee Williams. Let me put it to you this way. If it's bad, it's bad. And I'll give you this example. Anybody go to South Lawrence High School in here? I'm sorry. Both of my daughters did. Back in the day, now my daughters are, well, one of them's nearly 30, one of them's beyond 30. So it's been a while since they were in high school, but back 10, 15 years ago, they were well known for producing, through the music department, a spring musical. I don't know if they still do that anymore or not. The woman that directed them back then, who ran the choral program, you know, she thought she was God's gift to the theater. My daughters were both musicians, 
So they played in the orchestra pit for them. Because they played in the orchestra pit for these musicals, I was obligated to go. Okay, fine, doing my parental duty. I had to hide before the show, during intermission, and then haul my cookies out of there as fast as possible because I knew I was going to have somebody's parent who was the star of the show running up to me going, wasn't my kid great? They're ready for Broadway, don't you think? At the South Florence High School, they're ready to go to New York. Oh my God. You know, and I'd sit there and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the restroom during intermission. Isn't my child great? Well, can you imagine what happens when they do that? All right, we won't go there, <laughs> even though I just did. And I would go, no, the thing is dreadful. And I've said that. And then they would say, well, they're only high school kids. I'm sorry, if it's bad, it's bad. Now you may think, well, God, you could have at least, you know, told the white lie. And I did very often because I didn't want to hack people off. But what I'm getting at here is you still got to have some way to evaluate it. I don't care who's doing it. You go to New York, you pay $5,000 to go there to see a, a Broadway show. If it's bad, it's bad. If you're seeing it at South Florida High School, it's bad. But how do you determine that? And it's not purely what I personally like. I have things that I like more than other things. Trust me, I'd rather watch Bill Dance Catching Bass than watch Shakespeare on PBS. And this is what I do for a living. Anyway, where were we? Last one. What's today? Wednesday, Monday. Page 34. We're still feeding the idea of audiences' expectations. What I began talking about on uh, Monday, rather, was the fact that there is different kinds of theater being produced across this country today, and each kind of theater has a guiding philosophy behind the types of plays that they choose to produce. Each one of them has a different part within our society in terms of theatrical entertainment. On page 34 under the heading of Broadway, we're not going to worry about touring theater, but getting us back into this frame of thought here, the author says to us on 34 under Broadway, Broadway is the name of the oldest professional theater in New York City. It refers specifically to plays performed in the large theaters in the district near Times Square, New York City. From 1920 until the early 1950s, most new plays written in the United States were originated there. And productions in other areas were usually copies of Broadway productions. And it still holds true. You go to see a Broadway-style musical over at the Florence Little Theater, which is our local community theater, they're trying to replicate what was on Broadway as far as their budget and talent will allow them. But the point that I made about New York and Broadway is that it's the only commercial theater in this country. Plays are being produced specifically to make millionaires out of the people who have invested in it. This is the reason they spend so much money in terms of national marketing. This is the reason why they bring in Hollywood actors and actresses to perform the leading parts. They're using it as a marketing ploy for you to say, oh, let me go see so-and-so in this Broadway play. It's all marketing. And it's the same thing that I suggested in terms of television and film. It is being produced to make money, not necessarily to make some wonderful artistic statement about the world in which we live. That is a byproduct, yes, but that is not the focus of the Broadway theater. The second thing I began talking about at the end of class is what is now known as regional theater. 
and I gave you the historic evolution of that. So we start, started talking about Broadway. Now we're up to regional theater. <coughs> regional theater, as I said, is something that was on the plate of John F. Kennedy when he was inaugurated back in 1960. And with the push and the support from the federal government, of course, what we're talking about here in terms of support from the federal government is a federal agency that is now known as the National Endowment of the Arts, which means that about one one hundredth of every penny you pay in uh, income taxes goes to the National Endowment of the Arts, and those funds are used to support regional theaters, regional ballet companies, regional symphony orchestras. And what we saw in the 60s was major professional theater companies popping up in the various geographic regions of the United States. And as I mentioned, I, I worked for two of them, well, three of them, four of them, in the southeast, the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, Montgomery, Alabama, primarily with the Alliance Theater in Atlanta, the Coconut Grove Playhouse in Miami, Florida, but there's the Mark Taper Forum in Los, Al uh, uh, in Los Angeles, the Dallas Theater Center, obviously in Dallas, the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Seattle Repertory Theater in Seattle, Washington, they're everywhere. But these kinds of theaters then produce not just the one play like they do on Broadway, but they produce a season of plays annually. They market season tickets, and they're doing a play about one a month. The plays run for four weeks, and then they go to another show, and then they run that one for about four weeks, they go to another show. And again, the point here is, is these regional theaters are strong enough and financially supported enough to where they are able to bring in top quality scenery, lighting, costume designers, top quality actors. And you go there and you become, as the textbook refers to this, as resident theater. It means that you become a resident of that theater. You come there and you work on an annual contract. For example, with the Alliance Theater, I signed a contract and I built scenery for them for a couple of years. And I've built every set that they put on that stage for several years, or was one of the people building them. But you do a season of plays and everything is being produced, what we call in-house. Just like this theater. We're not importing shows. We're not pulling shows off the road, touring productions. We're a miniature regional theater, a resident theater. Our actors are residents of this university, of this community. They perform in all the plays. We manufacture our own sets. We manufacture our own costumes. We do our own lighting. We're producing our own stuff. And we're doing it day in and day out. And we do a season of plays here. I took the one that I had on the stage when y'all were here Monday. I've got it broken apart so that I can now load it on a truck and take it downtown and install it in that theater down there. But we're producing our own stuff. And this is what regional theater does. Philosophically, in terms of the kinds of plays that they choose to produce, regional theater its purpose is to serve the community in which it exists, to produce plays that would be of concern for that particular audience. Now, as I mentioned, the Alliance Theater is housed in downtown Atlanta at the Woodruff Arts Center, as an example. Atlanta has become, over the years, a cosmopolitan, metropolitan, diverse community in terms of its population. So they are going to produce a wide variety of plays that then serves the potential audience that they would have from that particular community. We're talking about the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles. It's going to be a little different. The 
probably a higher Hispanic population in that community. Well, they're going to produce plays that might very well speak to the concerns of the, uh, the, the Hispanic community there. But the point here is, is they are serving as a way of enriching the cultural nature of that community. Now, the last thing I want to say about regional theater before I move on is, is that regional theater is what we call non-profit theater. And in fact, every other form of theater I'm going to talk about this morning is non-profit. That doesn't mean the producer is raking in a ton of money through ticket sales and then packing it away in a Swiss bank account. The profits of the theater are turned back into the theater company to perpetuate it year after year after year. Now again, my favorite home theater, so to speak, my place I spent most of my professional life, the Atlanta Theater, the Alliance Theater in Atlanta. It's been in existence since 1964, and it's produced no less than eight plays a year since 1964. Now when I say it's non-profit, the profits are poured back into the theater, and it's also subsidized. It is subsidized by individual theater patrons making donations. Hell, you can't turn on the PBS TV channel without them going, please fund such and such. Well, these theaters do the same thing. I can use it as a tax write-off if I want to make a donation there. They get corporate sponsorship. We're doing a production of My Fair Lady, sponsored by Delta Airlines. Well, Delta Airlines has probably donated $25,000 toward the cost of producing the play. Theater in this day and age is incredibly expensive. Most of you, when Hurricane Matthew hit last October, were worried more about whether or not your car was going to be damaged or the roof was going to be blown off the top of your house. As a theater designer and technical director, I was more concerned about the price of lumber going through the roof. I've already got a couple of shows designed and on paper and if the price of lumber had shot through the roof I'd have had to redesign those shows because we wouldn't have been able to afford to build them and that's what I'm thinking I'm sitting there listening to the roof of my house rattle and shake and roll going oh god the price of lumber Monday's going to be through the roof because everybody's going to be repairing their homes and I'm not going to be able to afford what I've put on paper for the next play you know yada 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 but regional theater is subsidized and supported. It's non-profit. Now I'm going to jump around and not go necessarily by the order in which the author has these things in the textbook, but the next type of theater I want to speak to is what we call semi-pro theater. There is only one of these in the state of South Carolina. There is no regional theater in South Carolina to speak of. But in Columbia, there is a theater company called the Trustus Theater Company. Semi-pro means that it, that's exactly what it is. It's semi-professional. Now, what does that mean? It means that it's a mixture of amateurs and professionals. Mixture of amateurs and professionals. They have theater professionals running the, the theater. They have professional actors playing the major roles. They have a professional director. They have professional designers. But what they do is they intermix amateurs, people who like doing theater, who are pretty good at it, in supporting positions within the theater company, meaning actors or characters in the play that only has five, eight, ten lines of dialogue. You know, they use amateurs, people that just enjoy doing theater. They use amateurs to help sell tickets, to be the ushers, to work in the scene shop or the costume shop, or to help with lighting, or to run the lighting console or the audio console during the show. This way they are able to keep their costs to a minimum. Just like with regional theater, they're subsidized. 
which means that instead of paying $150 for a ticket, you're paying $29.95 for a ticket. More people can afford 30 bucks than they can 300 bucks for a Broadway ticket. Well, with semi-pro theater, you're cutting the cost or your overhead more by the infusion of amateurs, non-professionals in the sense that they're not being paid, and they can keep their costs down. Because they can keep their costs to a minimum, their ticket prices are obviously less, so they're risking less per show, and what you will find in semi-pro theaters are theater companies that are producing more of the avant-garde types of plays that do things a little differently, to speak to human concerns a little differently, other than just mainstream entertainment. They're going to do what we call the risky plays that deal with social issues that people don't like to talk about because, oh my God, I'm going to offend somebody. It's going to be controversial. Somebody's going to get upset. But if they lose money on the show, so be it. So their role within our society is to challenge society a little bit through the types of plays that they choose. Now, kind of an odd thing here comes to my mind. We're talking about with Broadway theaters, those things have seating capacities of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. Regional theater, 500, 750, maybe 1,000 seats. Semi-pro theater, 100, 150, maybe 200 seats at best. But they're much smaller. And right now, in the Atlanta area, which I'm most closely in contact with, uh, there's eight or ten of these semi-pro theaters in and around the Atlanta area. And they do incredible productions. But they've managed to balance between top quality professionals and in filling in the supporting roles with amateur people who will come and perform for free. They keep the ticket prices down, and people come to see what they're doing. But that's what we call semi-pro theater. A fourth one is where you are right now. Fourth one is educational theater. We're talking about college and university theater, even to some degree high school theater. People ask me all the time, how did somebody that's broken their nose ten times playing football wind up in theater. I turned down a college football scholarship for a theater scholarship. Looking back, I'm kind of going, hmm. But I made my visit to this particular school, and when I walked out onto their game field in their stadium, I saw asphalt around the field what you pave a street with. And then there was a pad and an astroturf on it. And I thought to myself, do I really want to spend the next four or five years playing on a carpeted parking lot? And I said, no. But how did I get involved in this? Well, I was on the football team in high school. We were producing a play. They needed people to move scenery and move furniture. So they went after the gorillas off the football team to do it. I said, well, this is kind of interesting. Next thing I knew, the next year I was building the sets. Then in the same time, I was also doing construction work for summer employment. Because the subdivision where I grew up, they were still building houses. It was real easy to walk around the corner, walk on a construction site, and say you need a laborer. Somebody can drive nails. Well, yeah. Okay, so I built houses for years. The next thing I know, I'm building sets for a living. But it all started with, basically, educational theater. Now, the question becomes with educational theater, who makes up the majority of an educational theater's audience? Who is the audience for the productions here? Who makes up the majority of it? 
students. You will be in April coming to see a show here as part of a requirement of this class. I'm going to force you to expose yourself to the world of live theater. Who are the majority of our participants, the actors? Students. This is what educational theater is working with, is exposing theater to. Students. My point here is this. We have a theater degree program. We have many students who have left this program and gone on to work in the business. I've got design and technology students scattered out throughout this country. One of my former students was nominated for an Emmy, a television Emmy Award for costume design for a little TV show called Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, starring the English, starring the English actor, actress Jane Seymour. They've gone on to do things. Although she graduated back in 86, somewhere in 85, 86. But anyway, the point here is, is this. This is a training ground. This is no different than the laboratories for a biology or a chemistry or even a nursing student. This is their laboratory. All right, now, we're part of an educational university. The majority of our students are students. Now, we could, as a theater program here, do silly comedies full of all kinds of foul language, sexual innuendo, and pack this place several times a year for those kinds of productions. But would we be serving the mission statement of the university using theater as an educational tool? We would not. In a four year period of time, you have the opportunity to see 12 productions here. In a four year period of time, our theater students have the ability to be in at least 12 productions here during that time period. If we did just comedy after comedy after comedy, we wouldn't be teaching them a thing, nor would we be teaching you, the audience, anything. So this is the reason you will see this theater program doing a wide variety of theatrical productions, from the ancient Greeks to the present, from tragedies to comedies, to melodramas, to farces. Because the guiding philosophy behind an educational theater is to expose not only our student audiences, but to our student participants, a wide range of theatrical entertainment. In the fall of 15, we produced a work by William Shakespeare, The Tempest. In the fall of 16, we did a play called Blues for an Alabama Sky, which takes place in Harlem, New York in the 1930s. We have a large African-American population on this campus. So we did a play that spoke to the concerns of African-Americans in this country today, last fall. The play that I'm fixing the truck downtown speaks to the concerns of sexual assault. So we're doing a wide variety of kinds of plays to expose our student audience and student participants to the widest range of theatrical productions as we possibly can. Educational theater. On the top of 36, there's a heading there that says Young People's and Children's Theater. Just below that is College and University Theater, which I just talked about as far as educational theater is concerned. The author's use of children's theater makes my blood curdle. I hate the term children's theater. All right, now you must ask me, Granath, why do you hate the term children's theater? What do you hate? Because I hate children's theater. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. 
Most of the time when you think of children's theater, you're thinking about child actors performing for a child audience. Okay? You agree with that? Children performing for children ticket holders. It's a nightmare. And here's why. The children performers or the child performer comes with a mother. Now I love the mother of my two children, but don't let her backstage. Shoot her. Ooh. Ooh. Lady, your child is the third daisy from the left. That's it. They're not the star of the show. Back off. We had a student actress here one time. The girl was 19 years old. Her mother came every night for every performance to help her get into costume and makeup, and she was the third bystander from the left. But she had an entourage, you know. Oh God, get this lady out of here. What I want to do is change this whole concept to what I call TYA theater, which stands for Theater for Young Audiences. Theater for Young Audiences. This is defined by adult actors performing children's dramatic literature for a child audience. Adult professional actors performing children's dramatic literature, meaning it's geared for that age level, for a child audience. Not children performing for children. And this too is a form of educational theater. Most of the major regional theaters also have a TYA theater company associated with them. When I worked for the Alliance Theater, we had what was called the Atlantis Children's Theater. It was a TYA theater. We spent thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on the sets and the costumes. We brought in big time professional actors to perform. But the reason I say this is also a form of educational theater, it is the first attempt to expose young people, and I'm talking about all the way down to four or five years old, to the world of theater, live theater. And I know with the theater company that I work with in Atlanta, a member of the production staff would go out at the beginning of the play, before the play began, and explain to the kids in the audience what was about to happen, i.e. that the theater was going to go dark. And that what did not mean that that was an, the first time that you're supposed to act like you're in a haunted house. How many times have you been somewhere when the lights dimmed to dark, people in the audience were going, Ooh! I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that. How silly. Anyway, the bottom line is, is this. They explain what's going to happen. I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm driving at. I did a show for the Atlanta Ballet. It was the Nutcracker one Christmas this is eons ago. We were doing it at the Fox Theater in Atlanta. It's a 6,000 seat theater. I'm standing in the back of the theater and there is a mother with two daughters who looked like they were about four and eight. These girls were standing in the seats, bouncing up and down, screaming, Mama, why aren't they talking? And I wanted to grab these two kids and go, it's the damn ballet. They don't talk. Their mother should have educated them about what they were about to see in terms of ballet, they're communicating through the visual, through primal dialogue. Quit checking your watch, I know what time it is. Uh, you know, it's, 
it, it, you got to learn. You got to learn. And the funny thing about it is, is when we get closer to you coming to see my show in April, I'm going to give you this lecture about everything from taking a bath before you come to the theater. Now this is something you would think that you would do in a children's theater situation. But I had a, just a couple of semesters ago a guy on the basketball team. He came straight from practice to see the play. He was soaking wet in his own perspiration and came in and sat down about right here with people all around him. And you saw him leaning because this guy stunk. Or the young lady that comes in and instead of a little dab of perfume behind her ears, back of her wrist, she took a gallon jug and dumped it like this. And it was like somebody walking around soaked in formaldehyde. You can't sit there beside somebody like that. Or the idiot that comes in coughing their guts up, who is unwrapping cough drops one right after another, and you're going, what? I can't hear over cellophane or unwrapping. Somebody has to teach you about etiquette. When was the last time you saw a movie where everybody in there wasn't on their cell phones on Facebook? I don't get it. But the pièce de résistance, and I have to tell you this one, Years ago up here at this traffic light where the Burger King is, there was a gas station that had a Taco Bell with it. I don't even know if it's still there or not. But one night it was a five for five night. Five burritos for five bucks. I'm not finished to sit still. I've got time. It's amazing how I can see that without <laughs> even looking. Anyway, five for five night. So they bought each five bean burritos with a six-pack of Pat's Blue Ribbon. They consumed that before they came to the theater. They came in and they sat down and they sat down right where he is. About 10 minutes into the production, one of those guys thought to himself, what I just consumed does not want to stay where I put it. Mm. He stood up and leaned over that wall and puked all over the floor. There's 30 actors on stage in performance. Puked all over the place here. He decided he'd better get the hell out of here, so he jumped over the wall, landed in it, slipped and fell, went blam! Went running to this exit sign, decided some more of it wanted to come out. I could see him from up there going, so he did this. He got out in the middle of the lobby and yanked his shirt tail out. I don't know whether to rename this place TYA or Educational Theater. But I think you get my graphic point at this juncture. Alright, the next type. Talk about on 37, what is called Community Theater. Florence has a community theater that's been in existence I think for almost 90 years. They have a very nice theater complex for themselves now. They got a donation from a corporate sponsorship situation a number of years ago, a foundation, and were able to build themselves a very nice theater to some degree. And they produce a season of plays as well. They have a children's theater company that is also associated with them, except they're children producing plays for children. But nonetheless, they exist. Now, in terms of a guiding philosophy behind the kinds of plays they're going to produce, let me go back to a statement I made earlier, and that is, is that theater is expensive to produce. You've got to pay for royalties. You've got to pay for electricity. You've got to pay for heating and air conditioning of the theater. You've got to pay for liability insurance. You've got to pay for the set, the lights, the costumes. You've got to pay to advertise them. There is a ton of money associated with it. So what kind of plays is a community theater going to produce? Well, I will tell you, they're going to produce a show like The Sound of Music. Any of you familiar with The Sound of Music? It's on TV every year. What is one of the key things about the musical The Sound of Music? 
what is one of the major features of the musical, the sound of music, other than the music, the singing, and the dancing? What does it have that no other musical has? Seven children. The Von Trapp family, that's the highlight of that musical, they have seven children. Now, why is that important to community theater? Because seven children have 14 parents. They have 28 grandparents, hundreds of aunts and uncles. Now, why is that important? All of those people are going to do what? Go. <coughs> We're going to attend. They're going to what? They're going to buy a ticket, regardless of what it costs, to see little Mary Jane and Susie on stage singing and dancing in this show, which means that they're going to generate revenue so that the theater can continue to exist. So instead of doing something to culturally enrich the community through choosing plays that speak to the concerns of that community, they're going to choose shows with automatic audience recognition and automatic audience appeal so that they can sell tickets to pay the bills. Now, let me finish with this and say that it is all amateur. Nobody is getting paid. Maybe the person that comes in and turns on the lights and cleans up the place every day is getting a small salary, but by and large, everybody who participates is unpaid. It is amateurs producing theater for the fun of it. Just like I prefer to hunt and fish as a hobby, there are people who enjoy singing and dancing and performing as a hobby. Just like somebody might enjoy playing golf, these people want to perform for their hobby. So it's in essence a hobby for these people. And I'm not going to say anything about the quality or the lack thereof or high quality or anything else. It's just amateurs doing theater for the fun of it. But that is the basics of community theater. I've got one more to finish up on Friday. I'll finish that. Think about your homework. Start looking at dramatic criticism.